This is, this is, this is. All right, summer may be over, but Chicago is calling. That's right, MXPX is going to be with the Ataris. Two nights back-to-back in Chi-Town. Going to be so much fun. Uh, Tickets are on sale. They just went on sale. I don't know how it's doing, but uh, I hope that you're buying tickets. Thank you, MXPX.com for that. Uh, Let's talk about shows. Let's talk about, of course, your voicemails. Uh, But in this episode, I wanted to kind of recap my last month. August was a big month for going to concerts for me. Um, Not only playing concerts, of course, is is a a favorite pastime of mine, but going to concerts as well. Um, I saw I saw three. I saw three biggies in August. Um, ELO. Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, Jeff Lynn. He uh, I would say he's a genius, a musical genius. He. He's kind of one up there with the Beatles, and I didn't even know it was their last tour. I just figured this guy's old. He's really up there. He's like in his eighties, and I just wanted to see it before it was too late. So I went and saw that. Uh, Tom and my buddy, uh, another buddy, went, and uh, it was at Climate Pledge Arena. We had a great time. The show, to be honest, the songs are great. It's a, it's like a blast from the past. You're getting this like, oh my gosh, this is like nobody does this anymore. But the show itself was 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 good. But they're not running around stage. Of course, I don't expect them to be. But when you have an electric light orchestra, they have this giant thing in the back that's got a screen on it, and it's like a spaceship. It's their thing. It's it's if you look at their covers, their album covers, they've got these spaceships on their on their covers and you know they had this thing this apparatus it was kind of like that uh but with a screen in the middle of it so different worlds would would be broadcast but it, it was really cool to be honest it was really cool it was like wow miles above what we have <laughs> you know but i just felt like man if you're called electric light orchestra you should have more going on with just lights because screen going the whole time but after a while you're just like i i'm good i see the screen it's just different things you know different worlds like a spaceship flying through the galaxy flying through a city and you know it's it was cool but after a while you're just like okay i feel like lights you don't get sick of lights the same way you get sick of a a video screen so now it depends on what's on the video screen of course but when it's a light show and you're just watching a band, you're, you're, you're enjoying the songs, the more the lights, great, awesome. This is, this is awesome. The more, you know, they do things that here and there um, that suits the act, of course, you know, it makes sense. You know, you don't want Black Flag to be playing on, on the set with Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd, right? Like, it's not the same look. It's not the same aesthetic, the same branding, whatever you might want to call it. But with... With lights, I feel like, man, there should be a little more lights if your name is ELO. Just my opinion. Uh, I still loved the show. It was great. I'm not, I'm not, the band played great. Uh, and I, and I guarantee you, Jeff Lynn is not necessarily, um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's directing the show. Maybe he's in charge of how it looks and that's why it looks like that. Uh, which is cool. Like I said, it's not bad at all. It just gets, it just doesn't change ever, um, even though the video is constantly moving and constantly changing. So it does change, I guess. If you're like, what are you talking about? It changes. It's changing. It's, it's what, you, what? I just meant the lights. The lights were pretty chill. And now and again, there were some lights that came up and, and it looked really cool. And that was my favorite part was when they actually used the lights on the stages rather than just the video. All right. I feel like I've really been complaining when I shouldn't be complaining. I'm not complaining. Sounds like I'm, com- I'm complaining, but um, I-, I loved the show. And it was, it's not going to be like going to the Super Bowl in 2024, right? Uh, or, or I guess this year's, su- uh, next year's Super Bowl. <laughs> this season's Super Bowl, 2025. Can I just say, NFL season has started. I won't get on it, but I might have to be talking about that a little bit on the podcast. So call in. 
tell me what you want, uh, who you want to win the Super Bowl this year, what you're thinking. And of course, if you're going to be coming to Chicago, let me know. Uh, all right, back to this. Um, ELO is great. I don't mean to be complaining. I just wanted to, instead of, I feel like I'm constantly positive when it comes to music because I don't want to talk shit. I don't want to, I don't want to disparage and, and that's still true i don't want to but sometimes it's like okay i'm just not saying what i think to be nice and i don't think this is mean i think this is just we're in 2024 a lot of the crowd was older than i was um it was it was definitely more chill than you would think but i think the older acts in general and i mean acts from the 1950s 1960s into the 70s those acts, uh, they don't promote the same way. It's all traditional. It's all just through Live Nation or whoever's promoting the shows. Um, their social media, I mean, their, their fans aren't really on social media. Maybe they are, but they're not really, I'm kind of like speaking for them. I'm just wondering why, there's got to be a reason why the crowd isn't as hype and why their light show is not as hype. It's because it's not a demand for that audience. And I'm coming from a, an audience that's that's got a demand for a kind of like all things. You know, I like modern things. I like old school things. Um, you know, when it comes to to NFL, I had to stand back and go, okay, times are a changing because it kind of annoyed me that they kept changing the whole, you know, all the rules of football and all this and that. And I'm just like, okay, things are going to change over time. They changed back in the day back when football was starting out, people would game the system. They would, you know, it wasn't illegal to hide a football under your jersey at one point. So, like, one of the teams, one of the coaches was like, oh, yeah, so here's a trick play. We're going to huddle you back. Nobody will see who has the ball. Hide the ball under your jersey. Run. And everybody runs, and nobody knows who to tackle. And sure enough, it worked. They were just crushing teams. I wish I knew all the details on that, but, uh, you know, uh, as like who the teams were, what year it was. It was like the first couple years of the actual sport of football, NFL. All right, back to shows. I keep, see, football just keeps pulling me back in. Ah, back to shows. And before I get too far, I, I want to talk about Warrant. I want to talk about Metallica. MXPX is coming to Chicago. I know I mentioned that. That's December 13th and 14th. That's Friday the 13th. Ooh, scary. And Saturday, December 14th. It's at Metro. That's two nights back to back. Yes, we will be doing different sets. Uh, we played Bremerton. I'll talk about Bremerton in a minute because I want to kind of review my summer a little bit. But Chicago's going to be fun. You know, we kind of learned a little, you know, we always learn things, you know, about, okay, what do we want to do? We're always tweaking the sets. Um, in the new era, we've had, we've been playing a lot of the certain songs. Of course, we're going to play favorites. We're going to get into some old school deep cuts. Uh, it's going to be so much fun. So the Metro, the Metro, I think it's just called Metro. Everybody just calls it the Metro, but it's called Metro. And it's a place we've played many, 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 many times. And I'm looking forward to going back because I know I know they've upgraded the dressing rooms by now. Uh, and maybe even the sound system. So the dressing room situation was so weird. It was like downstairs. It's probably still downstairs. It's probably still in the same spot. But it was like a locker room. And it wasn't like that it was that bad or whatever. But it was just like you're away from everything. And then... Like to get up to the to stage, you go up these stairs behind the stage. It wasn't honestly that bad of a setup. Just the dressing rooms themselves weren't weren't really set up great. They weren't super comfortable. But this is I'm talking nineteen nine like mid nineties, late nineties. That's really when we had a run. We played there again with Lagwagon on a co headlining tour, mid two thousands. We were trying to it was sort of like the end of that that mid to late 2000 era for MXPX was was that Lagwagon tour or one of the tours we ended on. I don't know. We didn't end anything. I'm just saying like that was one of those things. I feel like that was the end of that era where, okay, we're going to lay low for a minute, come back, do 
do new things, plans within plans, things like that, albums like that. Um, back to the Lagwagon, back to Metro. We played we played Lagwagon with Lagwagon at Metro, and I don't really remember it. I remember a lot of shows on that tour, but I don't remember playing Chicago, which is so weird. Um, I think I must have partied hard that night. <laughs> I imagine. Chicago knows the part. Chicago parties hard. I, I'm just straight up. I met DMX in Chicago, and I have a picture to prove it. I've posted it online before. Uh, I was just walking down the street, and he, he came out of a hotel. Uh, actually, no, going into the same hotel. He, he was coming out of the hotel. I was going in. And uh, I was like, dude, DMX, what's up? And he's like, hey, man. He didn't know. He doesn't know me. I just, you know, introduced myself, said, hey, can I get a picture? And he's like, sure. He wasn't super friendly like I'm uh, being <laughs> on this podcast. Uh, he was much less talkative. He was more, he was not unfriendly, but he was like, he wasn't like, hey, bro, you know, like, let's hang. He was just like, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyway, Chicago, wild nights in Chicago. Man, I can't wait to get back. It's going to be the last shows we do in December, the last shows we do of 2024. And, uh, and then last shows we do out on the road. That's what, that's what I mean. Um, who knows? There, there may be a live stream. What do you think? Um, so anyway, those tickets are on sale right now. Go get them. MXPX and the Ataris at Metro. MXPX.com for tickets. We also have new merch up there. Hoodies, t-shirts. We have this awesome PX racing tee. My favorite tee. I love it so much. Um, to, but to be honest, one of the best, uh, the best selling tea right now is MXPX Rolling Strong. It's a green tea. It's got a print on the backside. It's awesome. I love it. It's, 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 there's so many cool designs right now. MXPX.com for it. Uh, thanks for keeping the lights on. Thanks for allowing us to keep doing what we do. Honestly, when you go to MXPX.com and, and order a shirt or a vinyl, whatever it is, that helps me keep doing this podcast because I wouldn't have time to do this podcast if I was working a, re a real regular job, right? So thank you for that. I appreciate you. Don't, don't think that it goes unnoticed. Um, uh, we're mom and pop over here, so everything you guys do really does support MXPX. All right. All right. Uh, let's get back to shows, and then I'll get to some voicemails, all right? Um, Warrant. I went to Warrant with Tom. Uh, Tom was Nesky, our guitar player. And so Tommy Rat actually was our connection. He and the singer of Warrant are friends, and he does sound for him in Tucson and, and does things for him in Tucson. I didn't actually know this until after the show, but all he said was, hey, my boy, my boy works for them, someone I've actually met and, and know. And so I, I texted him and was like, hey, bro, let's, you know, I heard uh, you're coming to Bremerton. So... Warrant came to Bremerton, Washington, and they played. They basically played the Kitsap County Fair, but it wasn't. It wasn't really the. Yeah, it was the fair. It was the Kitsap County Fair, but it's separate. So you go and you, you can pay separate and go to that. But once you pay for that, you can go to the fair as well. So Tom and I went. They hooked us up. We got in, and <clears throat> we were a little early. Um, Heart to Heart was playing, and uh, the Seattle band. Not quite what they once were. Uh, their lead singer is not currently with them. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. But um, anyway, Tom and I walked around. <laughs> we walked around the Kids Have County Fair in the carnival. There's rides, and, and we, got, we got an ice cream cone. I got an ice cream cone. I think he got one, too. Um, and uh, we just had... A blast because we just walked we didn't go on any rides uh, i'd say that but it, it felt it felt like we were on a little dude date a man date uh but we went and got beers and watched warrant play and they played great they were really great i think all of the members are original except the lead singer because the lead singer died so the lead singer passed away if, i don't know three four years ago five years ago maybe um and Actually, I, I could be completely wrong on that. I, I don't know when he passed away, but the truth is he did pass away, and eventually they decided to keep going after a little hiatus, I think. But uh, the new singer sounds great. He looks like 
he looks like a villain in a Disney movie. Not maybe one of the high ups, but like a mid tier Disney movie. Um, he just has a character about him, and he, and he was great. He sang great. So anyway, we had a great time. It was not the biggest crowd. Uh, gonna say, I. I, I would have hoped more people showed up for Warrant in Bremerton, but it's the fair. I, I don't know what to expect from that, honestly. So, um, had a blast. So, thanks, Tommy Rat. Thanks for hooking us up. Um, all right. Last show, and we'll get to voicemails. Metallica. Now, they played Friday and then Sunday, um, just two weeks ago. Um, I think it's, yeah, in August. And it was... It was excellent. I didn't see Friday night. Tom went to Friday. Uh, shout out to Danny Vigil, friend of ours. Um, he's a radio guy in Seattle, and he got Tom in. And I was kind of late to the game, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I'll go if you can get me in." And because uh, it was, I'm sure it was sold out. I don't know. I assume it was sold out. I always assume things like that are sold out. So um, anyway, let's not get into that. Let's let's go back into Metallica. So Tom hooked me up for Sunday, um, picked me up from the studio. We drove to Seattle, and we I just remembered some stories from the ELO show, but they're not that important. I won't get into that. Um, we drive to Seattle. We get there. Um, it's at Lumen Stadium, which is where the Seahawks play, football stadium. It's huge, so... We park a little ways away because parking right next to the stadium is $100. A, l a few blocks away, $50. And a few blocks away from there, $40. We, we opted for $40 because we can walk. So I paid for parking. Maybe I actually know Tom for, paid for parking. I was going to pay for parking with cash, but uh, they didn't take cash. Um, I paid for parking at Warrant. There you go. It wasn't 40 It was like... 10 or something like that. I don't know. It was cheap. It was cheap. Um, all right. So anyway, I bought beers, bought drinks, $60 at Metallica for three beers. We met up with uh, Danny Vigil and the KISW crew and their Seattle rock station. Great people. They play MXPX now and again. It's not even their genre so, so to speak, you know, punk, but I think some of our harder songs would fit with their, their audience. Anyway, thanks for playing us, Danny. All right, uh, met up with those guys. It was just easy. It wasn't super overcrowded, even though it was at a stadium. It was almost like you were in your section. You were in. Your, you had a section where we were on the floor, and you could just walk around. If you wanted to get in the crowd, you could just go try to go all the way up towards the stage, and it was more packed. But back towards where you entered into your the floor area of the stadium, it was fine. It was like, to me, it was just like, I just loved walking out those tunnels where the Seattle Seahawks walk out of. And, and it wasn't my first time being on the, the floor of Seattle Stadium, but, you know, we actually, Tom and I got to play football on that field when it was a football field, not, not set up for Metallica. It was epic. That was um, when we played there with Dashboard Confessional. We played the Seattle Seahawks Exhibition Center, which is a giant, 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 giant room. Um, I would say it holds 5,000, 4,000 people, five, some, somewhere in there. Uh, we played there with, with um, Dashboard Confessional on that tour. And after the show, Gloria, who used to be our tour manager and our sound lady, 1997 to to 1999 or so somewhere in there anyway she's awesome she's she's a showrunner you know in in seattle she does a lot of big stuff uh or at least did for a long time um i don't know if she's still what she's doing now but she brought us out onto the field and we got to play football with each other all the you know all the bands that wanted to do it and uh so it was brand new Dashboard Confessional, MXPX, all playing football on the stadium. So it, it, on the stadium field. Um, at, it wasn't Lumen Field back then. It was something else. Um, CenturyLink Field or I don't know. 
There's been a few names. I can't keep up with them. Current one's Lumen. It's just like people just sponsor the name now. That's something that's not necessarily changed, but the frequency of of the name change. That that's you know you you always had like a you know I don't know Duracell Stadium or something. Ernie Ball Stadium, but usually it would just stay Ernie Ball Stadium. It wouldn't be, you know, a different company every year or two. Anyway, Metallica was awesome. They played they played so many songs I loved. They played um, the only one they didn't play because they played it Friday. I think that I wanted to hear was Nothing Else Matters. They played Nothing Else Matters that night. But we got for the we got Enter Sandman. We got one. We got Ride the Lightning. I don't think we got Master of Puppets. We got For Whom the Bell Tolls. Yeah, so, I mean, it, uh, we got a couple of new songs, and they were, they were really good new songs, cool ones that I, I dug. Um, so, overall, they played great. I don't think they play to a click. So, just like MXPX, they're just playing the songs. I could be wrong. They might play to a click. Somebody maybe should call in and let me know if you actually know if Metallica plays to a click, if they play to tracks or anything, but I don't think they do. Because, not that they were, they weren't screwing up anything, but there was a little bit of sloppiness here and there, but it was good. It was like, no, they're playing good, but it's not perfect. Like, it was just, it was like what an MXPX show is. It's like, we play good, but we're not perfect. Uh, but it, it's it's live. That's what it is. You get that energy. If you're there, it, it it sounds great. It sounds, you know, it's when you listen back to a record and it's like, okay, that's sloppy over and over and over. I don't know. Sometimes you don't even mind that. But that's just because we're human. We've been inundated with so many artists um, lip syncing, playing to tracks. And hey, if that's your art, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not against it. Do it. I'm just saying we don't do that because we just didn't start doing that. That's not how we do it. Um, just like ELO doesn't have this crazy light show anymore. I, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe because that's not how they used to do it. Um, kind of, I'm confusing myself because they're called ELO, Electric Light Orchestra. Of course, they should always have had. How do you start out as a young band in the garage calling yourself ELO? electric light orchestra you're like okay we got to get some lights someday uh to like make up for this name but um but metallica they played great and i don't know if they're faking it or not but it it was it was satisfying to me and they didn't talk to the crowd a ton they did they they were like they had some seattle things they did some you know talked to seattle thanks for seattle well but overall they didn't talk as much as tom said they talked on friday the the, the first show Probably they're just tired. I don't know. Maybe there's not a whole lot you can say at a an arena tour on a on a sorry not arena stadium tour. And I get it. I get it. All right. Um, it was great. Had a blast. We got out of there. It wasn't even that. We got home. Tom Tom got home past two on Friday because there was a crazy traffic jam. He was parked the wrong, in the wrong place. He went the wrong way. Nightmare. Because of that, we parked in a place where we're like, okay, we know exactly how we're going to get out of here, and we'll make sure we go the right way. And we got home, I don't know, twelve fifteen, like twelve, you know, a little after midnight. The show, the show started around eight eight thirty, somewhere in there. So it was like, it was great. Um, the show meaning Metallica's set. All right, uh, let's get to a couple voicemails, um, just a sprinkle in there, and then we will. You know, we're going to, uh, you know, I'm going to be in with no effects in October. Um, we've been playing these no effects shows and they've definitely been awesome. But because of that, we haven't been going to other places. Uh, I'll just admit it. Um, we didn't get to Australia this year. We didn't get to South America, but um, we didn't get to Canada. But we wanted to, just the things didn't work out. So we're still working on it. We love you all. Um, we're just... We're doing things that we can do, um, both schedule-wise, promoter-wise, because the venues don't always have uh, availability when we can do it, you know, things like that. All right, let's get to voicemails. I, you know, a little truth out there. Just like to 
people that listen to the podcast always know a little bit more than people that don't. That's just it. All right. Here we go. Voicemail number one. See who it is. Hey, Mike. Uh, it's Chris from New York. What's up, Chris? I have a bass question for you. I'm a bass player. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if you've ever played uh, the Nessa Boogie 400 Plus amp head. Uh, I know that you're playing, or I think that you're playing the SCT4 Pro. I've played both. Uh, my preference is the Nessa Boogie Bass 400 Plus. Big regret selling that. I was curious if you played that or what your amp preference is uh, and whether you, have you been playing amp head your whole career. Uh, so curious to know. Thanks, Mike. Hey, what's up, Chris? All right. Hey, um, I have not been playing SVTs my whole life or amp, amp eggs, to be clear. Um, and I have played that Mesa Boogie 400. And I think I know what you're talking about. Um, it's, I like it. It's great. Um, I don't remember really paying attention to the tone all that much. I think I just played it and set up how I wanted it to sound. But, um, let's talk about my amp, my amp journey. Um, I started out with a gorilla practice amp, not a bass amp, a gorilla practice amp. It's a little, just a little thing that has to, you know, you turn it up and it distorts. So that wasn't the best but it was what I could get. And, um, but I saved up and I got a base, a PV, PVT 40 for 175 bucks, which my mom split the cost with me. She's like, I'll pay half. You pay half. I mowed some lawns. Boom. Got a base. And I, I also did that to get my, uh, I saved up to get, um, my Ernie, but my first Ernie ball stingray base, I put it on layaway at American music in Tacoma, Washington, and I saved up while that thing, I had put a down payment on it. And I, and I was, it was on the wall still, but that was mine. And I still have, I don't have that base. That base was stolen, but that was the original, the first one I bought. Um, RIP. I'm going to call that Gary in honor of Gary, my bud, who I let it borrow it. And then his roommate stole it from him. Still Gary's fault because he should have given it back to me. And, but yeah his roommate stole it anyway amps my f my first real good amp not good amp but amp that worked and it was loud enough and it was pretty early on it was before mxpx was a band and i was just learning how to play bass and trying to write songs and i got a, a fender combo amp and it was um i don't know the model number it was just it was a a fender 115 i think and um it sounded huge. It was so loud. I loved it. Um, but then I got a Galen Kruger. Once we started touring, I got a Galen Kruger. Um, that was great. I wrote it to death. It was solid state. It was very clean sounding. But it was great for what I was doing. It finally died. Um, Steve Kravak turned me on to Ampeg SVT Classics. At the time, they weren't classic. They were just SVTs. I got one out of the... Uh, Hollywood uh, recycler and I found I found one used in Hollywood and he's like yeah that one's great it sounds great for punk rock so the first SVT I ever bought was this huge hunker from you know 1970s it was like a 1970s not late 70s uh, amp and I used that on the road I toured with that for years and I had a, a leopard print face on the front of it I put like leopard print on it um, and it was like fur. You could actually touch it. It was really cool. I wonder if there's any pictures out there. But that's like our first couple tours. And then, um, not first couple tours. Our, our, it was like 96. Uh, so set, so third, fourth, fifth tour. Like after we started, uh, after, I, after we recorded Life in General and, uh, and started touring again, that's when I did that to that amp. Anyway, uh, so SVT Classic, which is, it's not classic. Nowadays, it's called a classic. I have a classic, um, but I used the SVT, just the original SVT head. And then, and then um, from there, I moved to the, the the Four Pro when we were just doing these big tours, and we had I just had racks of Four Pros. Um, the reason I use those is because they're so so solid and so versatile. I don't think they're the best sounding amp for personality, but they did exactly what I needed it to do. 
which is have a really nice bass sound that was controllable from the PA. So use those forever. Um, the last couple of years though, I've been using orange amps. Uh, I love the orange uh, A200, I think it's called. I don't actually own one. I rent them all the time and, and use them on the road. Uh, it's a solid state. It's like an SVT, honestly, but it doesn't. it's not as heavy, it's not as big, but it sounds so good. It sounds better than an SVT, in my opinion, orange. Um, but the one I do own and, and still use on the road, most of the time uh, when I'm, when you see us live, I'm using this amp. It's called the Orange Little Bass Thing. And I don't think they even sell those brand new anymore. You got to get them used. But this little bass thing is awesome. It sounds so huge. It's so light. It fits in our gear that we fly with. It's amazing. So that's what I'm using right now. Orange little bass thing. Um, orange amplifiers. Orange cabinets when I when I have them, when I can get them. And, um, and then when, when not, then of course I'll use SVT cabinets. Um, all right. And, and like I said, you know, Galen Kruger, um, if, if I ever ran across one of those, I would use one of those. Um, but overall I'm really digging the orange and I love how orange sounds. All right. I hope that answers your question. That's my, my base rig down, uh, rig rundown. I might as well just finish it off. I use uh, a Sennheiser wireless unit that goes into the amp and then that goes into a, I don't even like a sonar tuner pedal. It's Tom's pedal that I basically have just taken because he already has a tuner. Uh, and then that goes into a Neve DI. So I've got a Neve DI and that goes to um, the front of house as well as he mics the cabinet. So. That's my that's my rigged rundown. Um, orange little bass thing into either an eight by ten orange cabinet or an SVT cabinet, and then that goes into wireless. Actually, the wireless goes into the amp. You get the idea. Uh, it's been fun, and I feel like I have a decent rig right now. It always tweaks a little bit. I have two different wireless systems. It's not the best setup, so I have an A-B switch. So when I switch bases, a switch has to be hit or else you're not going to hear what I play. That's another little caveat into my rig. Uh, let's do one more voicemail, and then I'll, I'll let you guys go for the day. Hello, Mike. This is Michael again, and I wanted to mention that I did complete the homework assignment that you gave me. i never seen Jacob's Ladder before, and I did really enjoy it. Once I finished it, I did a little research online to see what other films it had significant influence on, and one of them was Oppenheimer, which I just saw a couple of months ago and absolutely loved. So your recommendation was absolutely on point. I did follow it up by listening to moments like this again, and it is definitely one of the songs from Self-Titled that I like, and I appreciate you sharing with us a little about what the experience of running it was like. I do like it, but as far as why I think I identify with That's Life so strongly among the songs on Self-Titled, and I'm going by the deluxe edition CD version, and I apologize, I didn't clarify that last time, is that I feel like it speaks to what I've experienced in this world. So I guess that's why I, why I like it so much is specific to me. I do think that I'm a pretty contrarian MXPX fan, and that a lot of your songs that I really like and identify with are different than the ones that a lot of the other fans like. But that's okay. Anyway, I do have another question for you. And this one is asking you to expand a little on Matt's question that you answered on the travel slog episode about the trip back from Indonesia. In that one, you discussed what you thought the first great song that you wrote was. And so my follow-up question is, what makes a song great? What is, what is your evaluation criteria? In my opinion, a song is a great one if it does two things. Uh, number one, make the listener immediately stop what they're doing and try to figure out its meaning or what it means to them. And then number two, when the listener hears it again, say 20 to 25 years later, they immediately start asking themselves about whether or not their perspective on what it means has changed. For me, the first two songs of yours that I heard that really met that criteria were sometimes you have to ask yourself and self-serving with a purpose. In fact, when you mentioned that you were on the debate team in high school, I hadn't heard that before, but was absolutely not surprised. Thus, those are the types of songs that I gravitate towards, both by you and other artists as well. Now, I haven't been listening to That's Life for 25 years yet, but it's well on its way to meeting that criteria. But what about you? Is there something specific that a song needs to do to make you stand up and say, yes, this one's great? 
I agree with what you said in your answer to Matt that it's subjective, but if you were to take a bunch of CD singles that you like and line them up on your desk and think about them, are there any common denominators among them that you think you'd see? Or is trying to describe why you like what you like a little harder to pin down? Uh, love the podcast, and thanks again for taking the time to answer our question. Thanks, Michael. Um, man, this is a tough question. It's, so, it's a great question. I love this question. What makes a song great? For me, it's not. It's got to be a few things because one thing without some of the other criteria could be an annoying song, right? So, number one, it has to stir something in me. So that could be it's pleasing, dopamine. It could be. This makes me think about my own life more seriously. Anything like that. And that also has to come with a hook because the hook, it has to be a catchy song. It has to be brought in a vehicle that is so needless to say, the hook has to be good. It doesn't have to be poppy. It could be a hardcore song for all I care, screaming, whatever, right? Like that, that's not what makes a song great. But for me, there has to be a hook, something, something to remember it, a reason to remember the song. So when you do listen to the song 25 years later, that hook is what reinserts the memory back into your brain, into your cerebral cortex. Um, I, I think that's number one. There's got to be a hook. And it does, th that could be a lot of different things. Because now we have things like visual hooks and, you know, like with videos. So, so what is the hook? It doesn't matter. It just has to have one. So that's number one for me. Number two. Okay. Number two, it has to, I, I think the hook is what makes you go, huh? You go, whoa, what is that? You know, and a hook could be in the form of words. The way words are put together could be a hook. It could be just the melody, the way it's sung, the way it's played, the way the beat is. That could be the hook. So it could be something that hooks into your brain that you hate, right? So that's why, number one, it's not just hook only because bad songs have hooks too, right? Songs you hate. Songs you're like, I can't believe this is in my head. It's, ah. Uh. We all go through that. So, number one, hook. Number two, I don't even know. I mean, I'm just trying to make up a, trying to teach right now without having any time to plan the lesson. But what makes a song great for me? Number one, hook. Number two, surprise something that is not expected in the song and it doesn't have to be again like with the hook it doesn't have to be any one thing it could be i can't believe they said that or it could be i can't uh i can't believe they tapped into what i was feeling that's a surprise it has to be a surprise whether whatever it is now a hook and a surprise is there a third thing? I think on a personal level, if you have a, what makes a song great is when it attaches to your life. And that's where you're coming from, Michael, with 25 years later, you can listen to this song and go, now, what's my perspective on it? And you, you go, you immediately go back to the first time you listened to it or some of the times you listened to it. It doesn't have to be the first time. Uh, whatever that is, that makes a great song. Now, not every song has to be that to be great. I, I don't think. I think, I think, I think great songs, there could be a great song that I don't even like, right? Probably. Um, do I like do I like um, Whitney Houston's 
and I will always love you, and I will always love you. I don't hate it. It's a great song. Do I want to listen to it? No, but when I listen to it, I have feelings. There's a hook. There's a surprise. Not anymore. There's not a surprise anymore, but there's probably a surprise back when you first listened to it. So even a song like that, that it's like, I don't hate it at all, but I don't love it. Do I love it? No, I, I don't love it, but I, I guess I like it because I think it's a good song. I don't know. I, I'm conflicted on this. So it's just, it's not black and white. There's so much to it. And I love this conversation. I feel like we should continue having this conversation. Um, I encourage people other people to call in what makes a song great for you 360-830-6660 um i'll check voicemails this week call in leave me a voicemail let me know um you can give me an example like i just did and i will always love you oh it's a great song but i don't want to listen to it so what are we talking about here um I love it when people love song, any song that I write. So just because you like, what were you saying you liked? What makes, uh, uh, you like, uh, That's Life. Well, I think a lot of people would like That's Life if they actually heard That's Life. But, you know, it's not one that's been out there in front, out there pushed. There's no video for it. There's no hype around it. So it's just a song. It's a beast. It's kind of a, a song that's going to sit there. You know, it's like a a thing. But it's not that we didn't like the song or it wasn't good enough to be on the album. Anything we, re we record is good enough to be on an album, I think. But sometimes they just don't fit on the album and they and certain songs kind of get lost and they get they get swept to the side a little bit. And I think, you know, That's Life is one of those. But I wrote that with things in my life, in my mind of, oh, some of the things we did as kids and, and I didn't even, I couldn't put all those things into, into the song. I guess I could have, but it would have been a long song. So, um, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate your call and I appreciate hearing, uh, a deeper perspective on, on listening to the songs, you know, not only mine, but, but any song that people put out, um, times are changing. So, um, but one thing that isn't is we're all always going to be human. Some sometimes some of us will be s part cyborg, but we're going to be humans. We're going to humans going to human, and that includes we love songs. There's something about songs that dopamine. So to recap, what makes a song great? One, a hook. Two, surprise. And three, it has to integrate with your personal life in some way i don't know how to say that in a better way i'm sure i can figure that out if i think about it but that's those three things is what makes a song great what did i forget all right that's it mxpeaks.com please go check out the merch and get tickets for our show in chicago two shows in chicago back to back friday and saturday friday the 13th and Saturday the 14th at Metro, MXPX in the Ataris. We're going to do two different sets. Tickets on sale now, MXPX.com. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you in San Pedro, uh, LA in October, October 4th, Friday night. Yes, Friday night. We're going to do it. MXPX with no effects, Dropkick, Dropkick Murphys, a bunch of bands. It's going to be, it's going to be a blast. Um, and then, uh, as you know, live streaming now and again i th what do you think should we do it more often let me know um if you haven't already subscribed to the mxpx youtube please subscribe to our youtube because it sounds i think it works best and sounds best when we live stream from youtube now if you're on facebook by all means watch comment love that and if you are on the, the live stream get in the chat the chat is where it's at it's so much fun i wish that i didn't have to actually play when we do these live streams so that i could actually just have fun with you guys. But alas, uh, I'm looking forward to the next few months. It's, it's uh, a lot of fun stuff coming. All right. Uh, before we peace out, 
Shout out to Bob McKnight for producing and editing. Much love to you, sir. Um, and thank you to, to you all, wherever you're at. Hit me up on my socials. Tell me what you're up to. Would love to chat with a few of you guys. I'll be looking. All right, peace.